Welcome to the Transcendent Minds podcast, the podcast where we explore the mysteries of the mind and the human experience. Join us as we delve into topics such as consciousness, spirituality, and personal growth with expert guests and thought-provoking discussions. Get ready to expand your mind and discover new insights on this journey of self-discovery. Now here's your host, Peter Michael Deeds. We have a truly special guest joining us today, Sarah Tai, who's a skilled practitioner in the art of tarot with a deep connection to the cards and a unique ability to unravel the mysteries they hold. So please join me in welcoming the wonderful Sarah Tai. Sarah, welcome to the Transcendent Minds podcast. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. It's great to have you here. I'd like to start with your early days because... It's often said the roots of greatness are formed during one's formative years. Can you take us back to your childhood and tell us about any key experiences or influences that you think have helped shape who you are today? Yeah, absolutely. So actually, my tarot experience started back when I was in high school. So it actually goes back to my childhood to a point, but I was raised um, very Christian initially, and it was so funny because growing up, I didn't ever ask questions about beyond what I was told to believe. I was told Christianity was the thing. You either were Christian or you needed to save that person. (laughs) And I just picked it up and went with it. So there's that aspect. But as I started getting into my mid-teens, I started having bigger questions. In fact, I still remember this one time I was sitting with one of my friends. We were sitting out for PE. So we were just chatting and we're talking about what we believed. And I said, oh, I'm Christian. And I just thought, oh, that's just everyone's Christian, right? And he said, oh, me and my mom are pagan. And I thought, what's that? I was just so curious. And when he explained, oh, it means we believe in gods and goddesses. My immediate thought went to Egyptians and Greek mythology, what I had learned in school. So I was like, people really believe that? And I just wanted to learn more. And just learning that there was another belief system out there that was not what I was raised with, it really got me thinking about other modalities and other belief systems. I I think of many Christians who break out of it, not many, but especially the teen years anyways, I went straight to Wiccan and paganism. I like jumped right into the occult because I wanted to learn more. And so tarot was front and center when it comes to looking at the occult. So that was really one of my first different experiences from Christianity was tarot. And when I first started with it, it was more fun and entertainment. And I didn't really see it as a spiritual tool. I just saw it as something fun to do with my friends and, ooh, let's predict the future. And then it just became a fun pastime for many years until about seven years, seven, eight years ago, when I was going through a really difficult time. And it was the first time I really just turned on my deck and was like, I need help. And I just was so blown away by the the messages that came through, not only exactly what I needed, but it, it resonated in a way that I already knew the answer. I just needed something outside of me to come back and say, hey, you know what you need to do. And so after that, I would turn to my tarot cards for other difficult situations. And found a lot of, again, really profound medicinal help. And it wasn't until about two and a half years ago, three years ago, I guess now, when COVID happened, I started questioning my beliefs because while I broke away from Christianity, I still didn't have set beliefs. I still didn't know what it was that I believed. I considered myself agnostic, but that wasn't good enough for me. I wanted to know, well, what is beyond that? And so I started listening to spiritual podcasts. And through that, I hear all these wonderful stories about purpose. And I was like, oh, I want one of those. (laughs) I really wanted purpose. And so I was in in meditation, different things. I would ask, what's my purpose? And tarot kept coming to me. And I kept saying, no way, because it's too weird. No one would understand it. No one would accept it. I was afraid of a lot of judgment. And yet it kept coming. And it was really when I lost one of my main in-source, like income sources that just went away on me unexpectedly. I was learning about one of the tarot cards, which speaks about everything happens for you, not to you. So I was going through this period of panicking and trying to find the lesson in it. 
And I just thought, oh my gosh. And then through me trying to ground myself in my panic, I heard this clear crystal voice that said, go work on your business. And that was really when I finally was like, okay, I'm going to do this. And that was two and a half years ago, almost three now. And it was honestly the best thing I've ever done. So it really evolved with me. But tarot has been a really big anchor in my spirituality overall. And I feel like I've really found my calling. What was the card? Oh, it was the wheel. Oh, the wheel of fortune. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Was that the defining moment in your life? Was that the turning point that guided you towards reading the tarot? When it comes to reading professionally, yes, definitely. There were other little epiphanies along the way that led me to that point because I had to go through these little, they weren't little to me, but these big shifts, like mindset shifts. Because I remember when it first came to me, I was like, oh, heck no. So I had to go through this period of being more open and being more open and then finally being like, okay, fine, I will do this. And you you mentioned when your income dried up and there was a series of events because I often find that personal passions and professional aspirations usually intersect in some way. How did your interests evolve over time? And when did you realize that tarot was the path you actually wanted to pursue? Oh, that's a great question. I've always been more of an entrepreneurial spirit, probably the last several years. I haven't worked for anyone else. I've done like gig work, like food delivery or sales. I really just like wanted to work for myself, but I wanted to do something that also was meaningful. And I didn't find that in sales because sales is a very competitive world that I just was like, oh no, this isn't for me. And then gig work was like, okay, I'm making money, but I'm not really doing anything that feels like it's making a difference in the world. And what's interesting too is, so I knew I wanted to do something for myself and I also knew I wanted to help people, but I didn't really know how to merge the two. And it wasn't until when I was in that predicament where my income went away. And thankfully, I'm very resourceful. So I found other ways to make income while I built my business. So I wasn't totally put out, but it did shake up my world a lot when it happened. But I did have to dip my toe into it. Okay, so I'm getting this calling that I should be doing tarot, but I don't really know if I'm good at it. And so I put it out just with my small social media group. I was like, I think I want to be a tarot reader. If you want a free reading for me, message me. And I just want feedback to see if, can I actually do this? And that was really the moment that I realized that there was something here because most of the people that reached out to me were not in my inner circle. They were not people I knew very well. They were like acquaintances on my social media. And not only did all of them come back and tell me, oh my gosh, you hit the nail on the head. You you somehow know exactly what I'm going through in my life right now. But I actually had two different people independently reached out to me and said, hey, can I like Venmo you a couple dollars? Because this was so profound. It gave me exactly what I needed in this moment. And I just want to thank you. And that was really my like, oh my gosh, there is really something here. I'm not just crazy. I'm not imagining I'm being called into this. There is a reason I'm supposed to be doing this. So that was, I think, the aha moment for me. That's interesting because that uh, series of preceding events that led you to this point were meant to be so that you could really start to embrace and embody your mission and your purpose and find meaning and significance for your life and what you have come here to do, even though this may be a transitory thing or it may be a permanent thing one doesn't know yet, but or you may know. But I think that there are always stepping stones in life and this might be the first part of your esoteric pathway into the metaphysical realms, which is becoming much more salient in our landscape today. And embarking on any journey is undoubtedly demanding. Not everybody can be an entrepreneur, otherwise the world would be full of them. But can you walk us through any challenges you faced early on? And how did those challenges, from your perspective, shape your character and influence the decisions you made? Yeah, mostly I think it's so funny because when you look back, and for me, when I look back, I start seeing all the different odd jobs that I had that actually helped me with this one. Like before, when I was first dabbing in the entrepreneurial world, I did Mary Kay. I sold Mary Kay. 
And I learned so many things about finding leads and connecting with, you know, customer service and how to run a business. And obviously it wasn't like running my own business, but there was like key elements to that that I immediately took. Okay. When I work with people, this is, you want to set a schedule. When you set up something, you connect with them, you make sure they're comfortable. I think I took a lot from that in sales. I don't give up on things very easily, which I think that persevering nature just stuck with me too. Work with sales and with through Mary Kay and other businesses, I also learned, find your why. That's a good place to start. And so that was one of the first things I did. And I didn't even have to think about it. It was like when I sat down to write my business, my first thing I wrote down was, why am I doing this? What's my why? And I don't think that I would have known to start there if I didn't have these previous experiences that taught me that. And another thing I want to mention, which isn't really entrepreneurial based, but it's more spiritual based, but I think it was something that I needed to do to clear out space for finding the tarot. When I first started my spiritual journey, which was, like I said, about six months before I went live with my tarot business and before I really found tarot, I was listening to this podcast. It was the perfect mixture of science and spirituality, which I needed because I didn't know what I was delving into. And I still am pretty skeptical. I like to have a healthy sense of skepticism. So I wasn't ready for what a lot of people refer to as woo. I wasn't ready for that. So I needed something really grounded. And so I found this podcast called Expanded. And it was all around manifestation, but about neuroplasticity and changing and rewiring your brain. And so they had this workshop about going back and doing inner child work, shadow work, things like that. And so I was like, okay, I want to do this. I I don't know anything about it, but I'm going to do it. And clear as day, this is the first time I ever really heard my intuition speak to me. And it came at the most random moment. I had already signed up for the course and I was already listening to the podcast. And it was maybe like a weekend. I think I was putting groceries away. It was so random. And I heard clear as day, if you want to do this work, you need to not keep alcohol in the house. And it was just like, what? (laughs) Where did that come from? And I know it wasn't my own voice because my immediate question was why. It's like, I don't understand. And I'm a single mom who at the time was living from society stance of, your child is alive. Your child is good. They're tucked into bed. Have that glass of wine. Celebrate yourself. It was just this idea of you deserve it. And I was a full-time working mom. I have my daughter full-time because her, her dad passed away a few years ago. And then I'm working full-time. It was a lot. And I was buying into that. Yeah, have that glass of wine. You deserve it. And my father is an alcoholic. So I'm also very careful with alcohol. So for me, it was always like, don't have too much. Have one glass, maybe two if you're wanting to party it was like a glass of wine almost every night. And I didn't realize it. But once I chose to listen, because it was very clear, like you want to do this work, you need to not keep alcohol in the house because I didn't realize that if I had alcohol, I was going to drink it. I was not going to be able to just say, oh, not tonight. I'm going to do my spiritual work. It was going to be like, it was a hard day. I'm going to have a glass of wine. And then I'm not going to feel like doing this delving spiritual work. And so I listened. And the first couple of weeks were rough. Um, I had a lot of anxiety and a lot of just, I was feeling a lot of different things. And I remember even asking my therapist I was seeing at the time, like, was I addicted? And he's, no, you weren't physically addicted. You weren't drinking enough to be physically addicted. You're feeling your feelings for the first time. And that was mind blowing for me because I didn't know that I was numbing. I didn't think that I could do it. Now I like, very rarely drink. It, it's not going to do anything for me and I just don't care anymore. But I definitely had to go through this purging where I had to get my mind ready to do this work on myself before I was even ready to be open to tarot. I feel like in order to do any kind of spiritual work, you have to work on yourself first. And once you're able to do that, you're clearing out the way for finding what your calling is. Lovely story. And I've heard it many times in, in different ways that you have to be able to get rid of the psychic residue that builds up over many years and alcohol is a depressant. So those things that want to make a mark and penetrate your consciousness so that it can give you the intelligence that you need and to have an operating faculty that can respond to your inner tuition. That's why your therapist says, say, you're feeling your feelings. Because you need to be able to do that because at the, at the base of all things is your feelings. 
that's a connection to your dominant thoughts. If you didn't go that route, then you wouldn't be able to invest in yourself. And also you are correcting what maybe your father or the last generation couldn't correct. Yes, I definitely feel that too. I definitely feel that cycle breaker energy yeah. around the alcohol, which is really cool to witness as a mother to my own daughter who has no concept. I knew as I remember at her age, I understood there was, I didn't understand what it was, but I understood that there was something that would change in my dad. And I knew it had something to do with this grown up drink that was forbidden, right? Yeah. It's all I really understood. She has no concept of that. I still remember we were watching this movie one time. It was like a kid's movie, but there was supposed to be like an adult that was inebriated. And she was like, what's wrong with him? Like, she just didn't understand. And I was just like, yes, I'm doing something right. Yeah, there's a certain responsibility you have as a parent, but also the way that beacons out from you. Because if you have the anxiety or the numbing, that can transfer by osmosis. We now know that things like cortisol, for instance, it can actually seep through your skin and it can go into another person's dermis, into their skin. So they start to feel anxious and they feel that inflammation, that anxiety because their cortisol levels have been raised because yours have been. So there, there is a responsibility for each one of us to manage our state and to control our state of being. I know that, and this sounds a bit cliche, but I'm going to say it anyway, but success is really a journey, not a destination. And along the way, we always encounter mentors and allies, and we learn all these valuable lessons uh, and hopefully align to those valuable lessons. Were there any key figures that played a significant role in your development? And if so, what lessons did you learn from them? That is a great question. A big key factor for me was listening to podcasts. That was a big one for me. Through some of these big podcasts I listened to, I would hear from just really important, see, I'm terrible with names, but I know it was like Neil Walsh. Neil Donald Walsh is one I got to hear from interviewed. And that's just amazing. Rashard, I don't know if you're familiar with him. The one that channels. Oh, got yeah. To, yeah. I would hear clips from them, but I would say that definitely people in the spiritual community, listening to spiritual podcasts, seeing the interviews, and not just from the big spiritual names, but from people who are more everyday. I think that was also important to remember that it's not just these big figureheads, it's everyone can experience these. And so many people are and have. And so that has been really helpful. As far as lessons, it's really just been, like you said, it's been a journey. So it's definitely different levels of my business. And and when I first started doing this, I knew what I did as a reader wasn't predictive. I knew that kind of going in because it just didn't resonate with me to tell someone about their future. And part of it was because I didn't believe the future is set in stone. And I do highly believe in free will. But that was really as far as I knew. The more I did this, the more I was like, no, okay, I understand. I understand more about it that A, I think that there's different timelines. I didn't understand that before and I couldn't communicate that before. Now I understand. I think there's different timelines. I think that we make choices in the present that branches us out in different timelines and different routes. Also, as I journeyed through my business, I also learned that I am a channel. That's something that I did not understand before. I knew spirit would show up for the client because I didn't want to take credit for what was coming in. And so I really believed there was some higher power showing up for the client. That's definitely still something I'm rooted in. But I've come to realize in the last few months that one of my gifts is I'm really good at removing my ego in readings because it doesn't belong there. It's not for me to analyze and figure out. And so I'm really good at removing that and just sharing what I see, regardless of whether or not I want to share what I'm seeing. I just start talking. And then there, nine times out of 10, I pull out a reading and I look at the cards and I might glance at it and be like, I don't know what this is going to mean, but I just start talking. And there are cards that will suddenly, the meanings will shift and the location of the card, which usually has a meaning, will shift. And I've learned to just go with it. If I'm getting a certain feeling, if I'm getting a certain phrasing that'll come in that I never use that phrase, but I'll say the phrase because that's how I'm supposed to share it. And it's like over and over again, when I trust it and just go with whatever I'm supposed to be sharing, it resonates with the person. The times that I've tried to edit it, which I haven't done in a long time because I've learned, oh no, don't do that. 
that's when it gets a little, I could tell it's not resonating. So I've learned, okay, if you get the feeling, if it doesn't make sense to you, it does, it's okay. It's not supposed to make sense to you. It's going to make sense to them. And it, it almost always does like 99% of the time. I think big part of my journey has really been learning how to trust myself and understand what I do. And I think when I started this, I didn't really trust myself. I needed a lot of validation, which I got a lot of validation. But even with that, I still was like, am I really that good? Are they really getting that from me? Of course, I, I would remove myself and say, oh, it's spirit coming through. But I would forget the part that I'm the, the one that's the middle person. I'm the one that, yes, spirit is speaking through me. But if it wasn't for me being in this position, I wouldn't be able to share what I'm sharing. And so I wasn't really honoring what I'm showing up for either. So it's been a journey of trusting myself and really learning what it is that I do. And another thing I want to mention too, as far as the other thing I've learned is I like to work in the present and not predictive work because I feel like that's where the empowerment is. I really want to give someone tools now that they can take and use now versus, oh, maybe in the next month you might meet such and such and they might look like this and this might happen. It's no, this is where you're coming from. This is where you're at. Like really meeting them where they're at. And I think that's what I hear a lot is people tell me, you're like telling me things that are in my head, telling me things about my situation that you shouldn't even know, which of course I don't. I'm just relaying it. But I think it helps them feel seen. I think it helps them realize that, okay, if this girl who doesn't even know me can pick up on my situation, then clearly there's something else bigger than me that's trying to guide me. And I think it gives them that confirmation too. And I think that's so empowering. When you go to a gym, you don't see any results the first week, nor the second week, nor the third week, not even the fourth week, until you are consistent with the practice. And there may be a weight that you cannot lift, but it's not the fact you can't lift it. It's just you're not strong enough yet. But with practice and consistency, you then create and radiate a signal. That signal becomes a transmissive beacon. And that beacon informs the unseen worlds that you're ready and you are inviting those things to come and live with you when needed so that you can be that clear channel. You can be that agency of amplification that enables and empowers those things to trust you, which you have to develop a relationship with so that you can embody and embrace it. But not only that, you can then enact and extend it to others, which is a healing balm. It's a healing agent. And with any kind of healing agent, you have to be able to nurture it, respect it, make sure it's clean, and just trust it so that your body's like a straw. If it's clogged, not much is going to flow. Try sucking a drink through a clogged straw. Exactly. And this is having a clear straw that is flexible, but also clear. So when that juice comes through, it can electrify. That current can flow. That's how I see you are being organized and propelled to be arranged in that way. And that will refine you will elevate and that will refine as you continue on your journey. And as you progress, there must have been moments of triumph and accomplishment. Can you share one of your proudest moments? And if so, what did that moment signify for you both personally and professionally? I think for me, there's so many moments that I think a lot of with what I do, it's more like the moments that get me are the moments where I just trust more. and the situation turns out better than I expected. And first of all, like as far as my journey, like some of the bigger triumphs is watching my business grow. When I first started, I want to say like the first year, I paid maybe a hundred dollars. I didn't know what I was doing. On the second year, it's like out the water as far as it's way more than that. But it was the fact that people suddenly knew of me. It was me learning, okay, if I just trust that the right people will find me, they'll find me. And then suddenly they were. It was like I didn't have to look very far. Sorry, that was my cat. The cat drama. Yes. <laughs> He's very melodramatic sometimes. He's normally very quiet, 
But whenever I do my podcast, he likes to make an entrance. <laughs> That's okay. He can be he can be on the podcast. But uh, yeah, so that for me was really cool watching it grow. And then not only that, watching my services change. When I started, I was doing just email readings and then I was able to shift to private sessions and really working on worth around what I was charging and learning what, what was okay for me to charge, what wasn't. It was a whole journey around that, which I'm really happy with where I'm at now. And I know that I'm still growing, but yeah, so that there's been that aspect. But then also, um, I still remember one of my friends, a good friend of mine, She's like, you should be doing events. You shouldn't just be doing these personal readings. You should be doing events and parties. I think you'd be really good at that. And I had all these excuses. I don't babysitter. No one will really want that. Or I don't know. I had all these reasons why I was saying no to it until she invited me to, um, she's like, I'm going to hire you for my daughter's 30th birthday. If you accept, I'm going to pay you for it and um, just try it. And it was fun. And I thought, I can see myself doing this, but I still put it off for several months until I finally put myself back out there again. And since then, not only have I loved doing events, I've been doing events now for almost two years, but I think my favorite part and one of the things I'm really proud of is I get to help change minds every time I do these events. I didn't realize that's what I was going to love about them, but I really love the fact that most of the people I sit with have never had a reading before. Most of them are like scared, but they're curious. They're open to it, but they're like, oh, don't tell me I'm going to die. And I'm like, I don't do that. You're good. But I love the fact that people come to me with certain ideas. And they only come to me, I think, because it's free. It's at a party. It's something relaxing. So it's not as scary as just coming to me and like paying for my services. They're they're at a party where it's free. So they're going to check it out. And so I love seeing the gears turning where they sit down with me they have these predispositions they have these ideas about what I do and who I am and then they walk away with something they walk away with a profound message that they didn't know they needed or um, guidance that they are on the right path or confirmation that there is something bigger out there than they realized for me I love being that little bit of change and helping people brought in their minds. And so that's a big thing I'm proud of because while I could just be doing this more as just entertainment, I really can't just do this for entertainment because for me, it's too too much of a spiritual practice. But I know there are a lot of people who do it just for entertainment. And for me, it's now I'm changing minds and I'm helping people. So there's that. And then I think some some personal experiences, again, coming back to me learning to trust myself, I was doing this one witchy party. It was like a Halloween party and I was supposed to keep it light and fun. Of course, you can't determine what comes through. And like I said, I don't edit anymore. I don't sugarcoat. So when a heavy message comes in, I just go with it. Although in my mind, I'm thinking, why here? Why is this coming up here? I had this one lady sit with me and right off the bat, I knew it was going to be heavy. But the very starting point card was the grief card. And the whole message was basically talking about grief was holding her back and keeping her stagnant and her life was not moving because she hadn't grieved something. And I, the moment I started talking to you, I could tell she was trying to hold herself together. And by the time I was done, she just broke down. She said, my dad died six months ago. And this is all what I needed to hear to help me move forward. So even though while I was self-conscious, oh my gosh, this is such a heavy reading for such a fun event. It was exactly what she needed. And so again, me learning to trust that, okay, even though I'm a little freaked out by this, I'm going to share what's coming up. It's what she needed. And that was a really important moment for me too, because it also helped me just trust a little bit more that, okay, it's not my choice. I'm the channel. I'm the one that's supposed to share. The more you can acquiesce to that essence, the more that you're able to build that element of trust. And it's like a connective fiber. It thickens. And as it thickens, it becomes stronger. It's a bit like there's the bar at the gym. You've been going week in and week out because you trust the process and now you can lift it. But it doesn't mean to say that there won't be extra weight coming on the bar because obviously if it's the principle of overload, you've got to overload your system sufficiently enough to get a training effect. But it's the same in like, with trust. You've got to be able to trust the nothing that you are 
for the something that you can be. That's the invitation. Yeah. And for many people, that's an inner earthquake. Yeah. It's so funny because I think that's why I say one of my gifts is removing my ego during readings. I can't do it in my own life. That's my own challenge that I'm trying to do yeah. is learning how to do that for myself. But when I sit with clients, it's almost easy for me to be like, I don't need to know and know why and how this makes sense. It's not for me. And again, that grow over time with trust. And I want to share a funny story. This one happened somewhat recently. And again, it really tested my own trust because I did not want to share what I was seeing. It was at a wedding party and like a pre-wedding party. And I had this gentleman sit with me. He was super nice. And he was just tell me about my relationship. Okay, cool. So I did three cards. One card is what's working for you. This is what's working against you. This is higher self message. And the one that came up in working against him, and I immediately knew what it meant. It basically was saying that while he was being committed to his partner, he really wanted options. And that was getting in the way of their connection. And I remember seeing that and I was like, I don't want to say it. I don't want to say it. (laughs) What if he takes it the wrong way? What if I'm wrong? I could really offend somebody. (laughs) And again, I was like, okay, this is deep breath. This is what I'm seeing. And even he was so nice. And he immediately was like, I don't know how you knew that, but I love my wife to death. She's great. But yeah, I do wish there was options and I can see why that would be an issue. And I definitely need to work on that. He was very gracious with the reading. And again, I think it's because Spirit knew that he was going to take it that way and he was going to be open to it. So it was, again, like I had these little moments that happen. It's every so often. So obviously I get these little leaps of faith where I have to just go with it and have to trust it. It's what they're supposed to hear. And every single time it's like spirit catches me and it's, you're good. We got you. (laughs) But yeah, it's definitely building a trust muscle for sure. It's like driving in your lane. You trust that somebody else won't drive over your lane or keep to their lane. There's always going to be variables in that. And it will drop bombs on you metaphorically to test that trust. So all that toing and froing of, can I say this? No, I got to say it. So you're building that muscle, that trust muscle, and you're cultivating persistence so you can conquer that resistance. And the more you do that, the clearer things will be. There'll be other challenges on the way. And that's funny because probably this question is part of that, but because I was going to say on the flip side, setbacks are an inevitable part of any journey. Was there a a challenging period in your profession and how did you navigate through it? What did you learn from that experience? The biggest challenge that I've had is, I don't want to say necessarily consistency because I, I have consistently worked my business, but there are times where things maybe slow down and I get caught up in that and I'm like, oh, things are slowing down and then I get in my head and then I don't really work my business as hard because I'm more in that victim mentality. And then I'll come back. It, it's like the cycle. And, and usually that's, it's probably a good thing that happens because that's usually when I start to realize, oh, okay, I got to work on myself. I got to go and there's something I have to go change or evolve or heal. And then I usually swing back around. So I mean, even though it's a setback, I feel like it's usually more like a planned setback. It's like you need some time. You need to regroup. So I think my biggest setback or challenge really is not getting in my head and trusting that, like I said, I'm a great channel for other people, for myself. That straw is very clogged. And so it's learning how to unclog that for myself and have that trust and surrender with the universe, which I have seen over and over again exists because of the things that I've shared that I shouldn't have been able to share. But that trust for myself is still a challenge. So that's probably my biggest setback is trusting myself, believing in what I do and trusting in the higher power the way that I am able to do when I sit down with my clients. Society tells us that we've got to work hard and become stressed and anxious and make the green, pay the bills and then recover. Oh, it's the weekend. Fantastic. I'm going to chill out. In your work, you need the rest and the recovery in order to do the holy work. Not to do the holy work and then rest and recover from it, but to to switch polarity in your thinking and make sure that the self-care, the nurturing, to be able to be that clear channel, you need to have the right amount of rest and recovery 
and sleep so that you can go ahead and do the holy works. You're not running on empty. Because when you get into the mind, you're running on empty. Yes, that is definitely a challenge too, because it's exactly what you said. It, it's an energetic work that I do. So it does, it takes a lot out of me and I have to be in the right headspace. And like I said, I'm, I'm pretty good at being able to just get into it when with a client, but that impacts myself too on my own personal time. Yeah, it's funny too, because I don't know, are you familiar with human design? Yeah. I'm a projector, so yeah. I'm not even supposed to have natural energy. <laughs> and learning about that has been interesting. It's learning that self-care is actually, I'm supposed to be doing more of that. But like you said, to society's point, no, you're not supposed to be doing self-care. You're supposed to be working. You're supposed to be pulling yourself up by the bootstraps and figuring it out. And as a single parent too, I think that there's that other element of, I have to survive. I have to keep my child alive. And somewhere in there, I have to take care of me and run a spiritual business. And so it's definitely I've learned from different podcasts of different people who do the work that I do, who have managed to curate their life to have more self-care and work their business in a way where they're able to show up as that channel and take care of themselves and support themselves. And it's pretty amazing. And that's my way of believing, okay, that's really my goal is I want to get to a place where I can have that support for myself, have that support for my clients and have that survival support too. And I know it's possible. It's more like it's that mindset shift. And that's, like I said, that's probably my biggest challenge is getting out of what society tells me I should believe and should be doing and switching more to the spiritual end that I know it's possible to do it a different way. And it's remembering to focus on that mind shift and not getting caught up in what society is constantly throwing at us. You've got to build the density of it by practicing it so that you can have focus time you can have free time and you can have admin time. But your free time is the time when those times when you are going, oh, I should be doing some work or I should be looking out to doing the business. And I appreciate it's hard as a single mom as well, but it's peenering you to get the recovery you need. Because sometimes the heart of the matter can only be seen from afar. When I'm out with my camera and I want to take a wide angle shot, if I get too close, I don't get it all in. I've got to take several steps back. And that way I see the whole picture and beyond. So instead of you looking at the frame and that frame being adorned with societal influences or fear or whatever it is, you start to look through the frame. As you look through the frame, that opens up a whole new genesis of possibilities for you because you're not conditioned by the frame. Not that the frame goes away. The frames can always be there. Do you only see what you teach yourself to see? I love that. That's a really great analogy. And yeah, it's funny too, what you're saying about when I have downtime, what can I do for work? I'm definitely guilty of that. And I think even as an entrepreneur, I think a lot of entrepreneurs have that guilt yeah. too of I should be doing something productive and but yeah, you're right. It's it's actually taking that time to recuperate and rest and self-care. And I love that analogy because framed minds are going to be, those frames are everywhere, right? It's what society has given to us, but we can choose to look past it. It's not easy when we're so used to looking in that frame all the time, but it's not impossible to just say, you know what, I want to see what's beyond that. I love that. That's a really great way to look at it. I used to, when I used to go to the British Museum when I lived in London and I'd see part of the artwork there, I'd see people sitting there looking at it and then commenting on it. And I would stand back from it and I would literally walk into the picture. I'd walk into the frame. So I was part of the picture and I could feel the picture seeping into my sinews. And it gave me a very different perspective and feeling about it and just looking at it from a 3D perspective, and then having a perception from that vantage point. So I had to go into my imagination to be able to walk in and through that frame and get behind the colors and the characters and the landscapes. So I felt part of that frame, but it was a different kind of frame that I was looking through. Yeah, that's so cool. That actually reminds me of I always like to listen to a few different podcasts before I come on just to get a feel for it. So I listened to your most recent episode with, I don't know her name, but the one that channels Albert Einstein. 
Oh, and, yeah. Barbara Wyth, she's doing a world tour at the moment. Oh, really? Yeah, it, hurt. it was fascinating. I was enthralled with that episode. But I loved to talk to her explaining imagination. I've seen people share the quote of Albert Einstein saying, imagination is more important than knowledge. And, oh, yeah, that's cool. When you actually hear it explained, that's oh. the first thing I went to when you explained about the picture and going into the picture and using your imagination. I thought, oh, my gosh, that's what he means. And not only that, but that's how you step out of the frame. You have to imagine something else. Yes, you imagine. have to use your imagination. So that was really cool. I just got to see what I was listening about recently. And then you sharing it just made it in real time. She's an amazing lady. She's actually coming to England. I'm going to meet up with her. But she's on a world tour to bring world peace through what she calls conflict revolution. And she's got some amazing stories of healing. Because that thing of us versus them mentality, the what's wrong mindset. And she told me a story about a lady in Israel who had the kind of us and them mindset. And she took her course in Israel. And she was very skeptical. She was like, this is not going to work for me. But I think a month or two later, she wrote to her and she said, I now see, I'm now looking through the frame. In other words, this us and them, it's not what it's all cracked up to be. Because we're yeah. one, we're a collective, we're one, we're a unified force. But it took a while for that to seep into her sinews and to, to be able to have that change of perception because her perceptual fee of thinking and lens was based on a feeling which dominated her thoughts. And that's all she could think about. And she kept looking at that frame all the time. And the more you look at it, it's like a person who, in jail. In a small cell, they repeat the impressions that they have. There's nothing else for them to, unless they go into their imagination. It's no wonder they reoffend. It's a right. repetition of the frame. And if their frame was some kind of heinous crime, then they reflect on that and they repeat it in their head and repeat it. I think that's why Albert Einstein says the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and expecting different results. Looking at your present role and its impact, uh, listening to your story, you've achieved some remarkable success. What drives you now? And how do you stay inspired to continue pushing boundaries in tarot? Tarot to me is a very spiritual practice. So it's definitely embedded in my own spirituality. As my evolution of tarot has grown, so has my spirituality. So it's been like a hand in hand thing, which has pretty, been pretty cool. But I think my biggest thing that inspires me is knowing that I'm really making a difference. And when I sit down with, with a client and I can see how they came with this idea of I'm a little lost and they left with more clarity and more groundedness. And not only that, but I feel like a big part of what I do is giving the power back to them, is reminding them that it's not me like I'm not the all-knowing person in fact I've had people tell me like oh my gosh this was like a therapy session and I tell them no this was not therapy this might give you tools to take to therapy and take to a licensed therapist who knows how to help you and un understand this that's why I've referred to myself lately more as a channel because I'm just the middle person and I like to remind them that they're right where they're supposed to be because I think that's another big thing too so many people think that they're lost and I think that there are different Obviously, there's a path that's, okay, this is one that's aligned with you and this path isn't so aligned with you. I think there's that aspect. But I think that we're all still right where we're supposed to be open to the next opportunity that spirit is giving us. When I have people come to me with, should I do this or should I do this? I always reframe it and say, this is the energy around this option. This is the energy around this option. So they can really decide for themselves which one is the right one for them. So I feel like what inspires me and what I, I really proud of myself or what I'm able to facilitate in the world is I feel like I really help people find their own discernment and find their own empowerment and get regrounded in this place of, okay, I got this. And I have more of an idea of where I'm heading and what I can do to get where I want to go. You're facilitating an environment that encourages them to reclaim their self-authorship. I want to talk to you about the language of symbols because Tarot is rich with symbolism. How do you interpret and communicate the language of symbols with your clients? 
Can you share a memorable experience where a symbol had a profound impact? So for me, it's not that the symbols don't. That's a hard one. I have this one card called, it's the King of Cups. And so the way that I read tarot is a little different than traditional, which I think is really important for anyone that's a tarot reader is to be able to follow what resonates with them. For me, traditional in a lot of ways, there are some things that are traditional that do fit, but there are some things traditionally that it wasn't connecting with me. And I took this course called Soul Tarot by Lindsay Mack, and that really opened my mind to, oh my gosh, first of all, I can let my intuition guide me in my tarot. And it doesn't necessarily have to be whatever the book says. But then a lot of her interpretations really resonated with me. So the way that I would read the King of Cups, some people would read it more personification or there's different aspects of it. But one of the biggest things that I've learned from the King of Cups is that it's about deep self-care so that way you can show up in service for other people. And there is one particular card and I don't have it here at the moment. I don't think I'd have to look for it. Um, In one of the decks that I have, the card itself, it shows a picture of two people sitting like back to back and they're drinking a cup of water and then out of their heart, they're pouring out more water. And that's probably one of my favorite symbolisms that I love to get and use because it demonstrates this idea of you have to take care of yourself in order for you to give back to the world the way that you want to. And I also love to to use the analogy of if you fly on a plane, they always tell you if you have a dependent. Yeah, you have to put the oxygen mask on yourself and then you're dependent because you don't want to be useless to them if you get it on them and then you pass out. But that one card, I wish I knew the name of the artist of that particular tarot because that's not what it looks like in all tarot decks. But that particular symbolism, I just love it because it really demonstrates this idea of take care of you so you can take care of everyone else. So there's different symbolisms for different ones. Six of swords. I really love the analogy of you see that someone usually in a rowboat And the whole message, it's around surrender and letting go of the wheel and trusting that spirit is guiding you down. And I love the symbolism. So that one's, I think, on Rider Waite with the rowboat. But it gives you that idea of you're on a stream. The stream is like spirit carrying you. It's okay to let go of the oars and just see where it takes you. There's a sense of rest and surrender with that one. The death card is another good one with the symbology. A lot of tarot decks... I don't think Rider Waite does this one, but a lot of tarot decks show like a butterfly breaking out of cocoon because death doesn't represent more mortality. It represents transformation and change and endings and beginnings. There is a lot more symbology than I was necessarily thinking. Mm -hmm. But yeah, for me, I'm like tangible. So when I get questions, sometimes I'm like, I need something to look at. So you you need to go and get your cards and put them in front of you. I have a deck in front of me. They're not like the Rider Waite, but I guess it doesn't really matter. Being symbolically literate is important. Many of us are not symbolically literate. When people see the death card, they go, oh, death, am I going to die? Without really understanding it's about metamorphosis or uh, rebirth. So it's important to have the literacy of the symbology in tarot. Yeah, I think it was just the question threw me. Because, for instance, the chariot. This one usually talks about you've outgrown a space, right? And I mean, if you look at the picture, he's like outside of the chariot. The chariot doesn't hold him anymore. He needs a bigger chariot. So I definitely do that a lot in my readings where I'll show the card and express this is what it means. Like this one, the Knight of Pentacles is the slowest moving knight in the deck, but it's because he's getting his ducks in a row. And if you see behind him, that's like all of his ducks in a row. He's getting all of the meticulous things lined up. So that way he's building a strong foundation. So there is plenty of that. And I do explain that in my readings. My immediate thought went to Rider Waite, which is like the traditional tarot deck. And like my thought went to, oh, I need to explain like the official symbol and symbolism. And that's not how I read. It's more my intuition and then being able to explain what the actual picture looks like, which I think is important because whenever I'm sitting with someone, I'm not sitting with a Rider Waite deck. I'm sitting with the deck that I have. I think this one is the Eight of Pentacles. And this one is all about. I love this one. This one's talking about teaching that it's okay to be the student. It's okay to not know. Usually when this one comes up, I'm speaking to someone that's, I want to be an expert already. And this one's, no, but you got to start off as the apprentice. You have to be the apprentice. You have to climb the ladder. Each rung, you're going to get a new tool for your tool belt. And even in the picture, she's got all the tools. 
this is the time frame. She wants it to move faster. She's got all the tools, but it's okay. You've got the tools. Now you have to use them, practice them. Each time you practice it, you're going to get onto another rung of the ladder and you'll get a new tool. And so I do go over that with my clients and explain the cards and the pictures do help a lot. And I think the newer pictures especially are more helpful because they're more imaginative and more creative. Rider weight has been around for hundreds of years. So the symbolism is more hidden, I want to say, because it's not so creative. And back then it was probably very creative. But now the newer decks have more of that creative and imaginative touch to it. They're a gateway to the essence. Yeah. That's what the symbology is. Most people don't realize why they have gargoyles on churches. They have gargoyles on churches because when you look at them, it just gets rid of all your yuck before you go into a holy place. That's what they were designed for because they're ugly things. They put beautiful stained glass and all these beautiful things inside, but on the outside, that's part of their symbolism. But if you don't understand that, you think, oh, that's just a piece of sculpture on the front of the church, but it actually had a purpose to it. People have challenges and skepticism with all kinds of metaphysical applications. And in a world where skepticism exists, how do you address challenges or doubts about tarot? Have you encountered skepticism and how do you navigate those conversations or do you just not go there? Yeah, I definitely deal with skepticism or skeptics. So for me, it's just I used to be really scared of skeptics when I started this because judgment was one of my biggest fears was, oh my gosh, how do I even explain what I do? But I haven't really dealt with a lot of skeptics. At parties, I've had people come and sit with me and I could tell they're like, show me what you got. I don't really believe in this. And nine times out of 10, they're the ones I convert. <laughs> they're the ones that walk away with something more than they expected to and with a little bit more of an open mind. Very few who've sat down and give them a reading and they just go, I don't get it. And I say, okay, I don't, I don't resonate with everybody and I'm not the reader for everybody. And that's probably the go-to that I have. Not that it's happened very often, but that's usually what I'll go with is I'm not going to connect and resonate with everyone. Sometimes you need a different reader to speak to you who can connect with you in a way that I can't. And so that's usually what I've done. However, I haven't really had a whole lot of pushback. Most people who have been skeptics, I've managed to make them look at it differently and walk away with something. And that's been really satisfying too, is not like to become full believers, but at least walking away with, that's not what I thought it was. (laughs) But one of the things that I do that I think helps a lot of skeptics is I've been told that I'm, I'm really good at making it more tangible and understandable. It's not just keeping it fully in the metaphysical. So for instance, when people ask me how tarot works, I always say that I don't believe it's the cards. The cards themselves aren't magic because that's what people believe. They think it's the cards. And so I tell them, no, it's not the cards. The cards are just a tool. And the way it works is all about intention. So if a client shows up and says, I have an intention to get guidance and I'm showing up with the intention of being a channel and a reader for them, that's all it takes. So it's that intention of trusting in a higher power and trusting that you're going to get what you need to hear. And so I think that makes it more tangible when I take the power out of the cards themselves. I'm like, it's not the cards. The cards are great. They're a great tool. And I think that for, especially for certain people, they really speak to them. Like for me, I've read Oracle cards, but tarot speaks to me in a way Oracle doesn't. But it's not the cards themselves. It's the way that I'm able to interpret the messages I'm receiving for the person that I'm sitting with. It's the same when I'm out and about and I'm showing people my images because I love photography. They go, oh, you must have a great camera. It's not the camera. No, you must have a really great camera. I said, no, it's your eye. I said, give me your camera. Give me your, your compact camera. Give me your $500 camera. And I will take an image that this $5,000 camera can produce as well. But it isn't the camera. It never is. Yes, obviously, if you have a better camera, yeah, you've got more options available to you, but it's your eye. It's how you compose the image, the landscape in front of you or the portrait. 
You look for the textures. You look for the leading lines. You look for the patterns. You look for how things mold and meld together. And the camera's just a tool. That's all it is. But people have this thing called gap, which is gear acquisition syndrome. They think, oh, the bigger the camera and the more I spend, the better pictures I'm going to take. It just isn't true. You've got to get good at your craft. And like you say, the cards are a tool so that you can become that agency of amplification for all those messages to come through you. Yeah, exactly. I love that analogy too. My mom is a photographer and she hasn't been for many years and I've been trying to get her back into it. And she's, oh, the cameras are different now. And I don't, the Photoshop's different. Everyone has a phone now. And I'm, I just, I'm going to take what you just shared and I'm going to share that with her because she's won competitions. Obviously she's got that eye, right? It's not about the technology. So thank you for that. Your tools are intuition. Your tools are your insights. Your tools are, yes, the cards, but they're only a tool and they provide a practical toolkit of understanding. So if you want to pursue the irrational, you need a rational title. So people can hang their hats and they go, oh, that's what it is, because we categorize everything. But once we've got that, then you can pursue the irrational. Because they see the card, they see the image. It may not be rational to them, but the card is. And then you can work your magic. Was there ever any examples where Tarot revealed something magical that seemed intuitive and transcended ordinary understanding? I feel like every time I do a reading, it does that. You did say that. Yeah, like every single time. I'll get something Like the phrasing I'll use will be totally different than I'll normally use. Every single time there's a key element of that. That does make me think of the turning point when I remember how I told you that I was going through a really difficult time and that made me pull out my cards and actually ask, I need help. What can, what do I do? That's probably the, the biggest one for me, especially in hindsight now. So it was about seven, eight years ago. And I was still married to my daughter's dad. And unfortunately, he had his own demons. He was fighting. He was struggling. And I didn't know this whole years later, but he was struggling with drug abuse. All I knew was that his behavior was getting scary and erratic. And I didn't want my daughter in that because that was the kind of environment I grew up in with an alcoholic father. For me, I was really torn about leaving because I was a stay-at-home mom. I didn't have income. I did marry Kay, but it wasn't really steady income. It helped a little bit, but it wasn't enough to support me and my child. And so leaving was going to be a huge deal for me, but I also knew I couldn't stay. So I was really stuck. I'm like, what do I do? What do I do? So I remember I just pulled out. It was the only time I ever pulled out my cards for like real guidance. And I did a a poll of what would happen if I stay and what would happen if I go. And if I stayed, the, the outcome card I got was the devil card. The devil card represents negative patterns and cycles where you're repeating it over and over again. And it's very toxic. There's no growth. It's just like you're on a merry-go-round versus if I left, the outcome was death, which was change and evolution. And I knew in that moment of all the cards I could have pulled, there's 78 cards in a deck of all the cards, the fact that those were the two that I pulled. And not only were they so incredibly true in that moment, but I already knew the answer. I just needed external confirmation to be like, okay, what I already feel is right. What I already feel is true. And that was the first time I was like, there's something really special here. Again, I didn't know what it was. I didn't know it was spirit showing up for me. I didn't know it was my own intuition. I didn't know any of the mechanics of it. I just knew that it was too perfect to be a coincidence. And so that was really probably the most magic It was a really hard moment for me, but it was a very deep, oh my God, there's truth to this moment. And since then, it's just continued to do that over and over for me. That's beautiful. One of the things it allows you to have, there's the material aspects of the cards, but they empower you to have a cosmic conversation. And there's also a lot of responsibility upon you as well. 
especially about ethical implications of offering guidance through tarot, how do you navigate the responsibility that comes with providing insights into people's lives? That is a great question. That was probably one of my biggest fears when I first started tarot was I don't want to misrepresent. I don't want to misguide anyone. Probably the biggest reason I decided not to to focus on predictive work in the beginning. And that was before I understood that, oh no, my gift isn't in predictive anyway. It's in the now. But when I first started, that was like, I don't want to give people the wrong answer, the wrong advice or whatever. But again, it's really evolved. And, and over the years, I've really just understood that one, it's not my job to tell anyone what to do. So when I give readings, I'm really careful about the, the, the verbiage that I use. So I won't say you should do this. It's you're being invited into this idea, this suggestion. This is the invitation. And I do that on purpose because I my job is to empower the person I'm sitting with. And so there might be a very heavy invitation. Hey, you should really do some of the self-work around knowing you're enough or whatever it is. But they have to make that decision. And so I don't tell them what to do. This is the invitation. And then even when I do the, should I do this or should I do this? Those ones used to scare me because, again, I was, I don't want to give the wrong answer. But that's why I tell them, this is the energy around option A. This is the energy around option B. Because they might take the most unideal one, the one that, like, I'm thinking, oh, don't do that one. They might choose that one. And that's okay because I don't think there's a wrong choice. If they choose one that's not ideal, there's lessons there that they just haven't learned yet and they need to learn again. One of the biggest things as, as a reader that I'm really careful about is A, not telling people what to do. And be really just giving the power back to them. Every time it's they're trying to ask me to tell them exactly, oh my gosh, should I do this or should I do this? Or am I making the right decision? I always try to turn it back to them. Another thing that I'll do, because I have people that will come to me sometimes and ask about their partner or third parties. And that part I have a harder time with too. But I trust that what comes through is what is okay to come through. Because again, I'm channeling. But I do have a line drawn to a point because... I always try to take it back to and say, I know you're asking about how they feel about you and what they think of the relationship, but let's talk about you. Let's talk about what spirit wants you to know about this relationship because you can't change what they're doing, but you can impact what you're going to do and you can make decisions around your life. And yes, maybe they love you, but are they good for you? Don't hold on to this person just because they love you if they're wreaking havoc on your own life. But it's also reminding them, think about yourself in this situation too, because you have your own empowerment to make those own choices. Ethically, as a reader, I think it's important. I want to say it's not okay to, to do predictive readings. So I know there are many that do. And I don't think that's wrong because I think they're picking up on certain timelines that is likely to happen. So I don't think that it's wrong to do predictive work by any means. But I do think you have to be careful in how you deliver it. And you, know, you want to make sure that you are giving the person something to help them and not possibly disempower them later. Very important because I know even in my coaching practice, I don't give advice to the clients simply because it doesn't empower them. They don't access their own sovereignty or their self-authorship. I, I can facilitate an environment where they can cultivate the soil to plant the seeds that can start to flower and blossom that can enable them to make the decision they need to make so they can nurture and tend to that, but they've got to plant the seed. Otherwise, it's a fix-it situation. Go and get a consultant. They'll give you the advice and they'll charge you hundreds of thousands of dollars for it. It's much more important that the person can come to it themselves and set their feet upon what I call the ruby road of their own progression. Otherwise, the patterns that people have in their behavior will either repeat or have a sense of progression to them. Which ones do they want? Because I could come to you and you could give me a brilliant reading, give me advice. I go, great. But history repeats itself in world trodden roots. And the patterns repeat unless you actually make the conscious decision to set your feet upon that path and find out for yourself with the tools you've been given through the reading or the coaching or whatever it may be. That's so well said. And what's next for Sarah? Right now, it's 
really just still working on my business and working with clients one-on-one and still lo- love doing events, working on getting into the wedding industry. I'd love to to do that. One other thing that I'm really playing with is starting my own podcast. So there's that. Um, and I've also been playing with the idea of starting courses or masterclasses. So it's not something I'm doing presently, but definitely I'm starting to get that push from spirit. I feel like I need to be doing more than I'm doing. So I'm playing with a few different ideas there and also looking at different modalities because to your point, tarot right now is my tool, but I do feel like it is a stepping stone too. So I feel like right now it's the tool that's allowing me to work on my channeling, but I do feel like there's more to my channeling than tarot. So there's definitely a lot of different ideas that I have moving into the near future for sure. But I think starting first is doing what I'm doing and and playing with more and more ideas of leadership because I I really want to take the knowledge that I've learned and I'm continuing to learn and and help in the conscious shift because I've definitely felt it and seen it. And I want to be one of those light workers that are just helping more and more people step into that. You're being groomed to be able to become a transcendent leader. So you go over and above the transactional or transformational leader so you can lead people into their own metamorphosis as distinct from just transformation. And this is your spark starter. That's what I feel for you is that you won't be able to scale just doing the one-to-one or the weddings, but you will be able to scale and have a greater impact, which I think you are being organized and propelled from spirit to scale it so that on a podcast, on courses, you can reach a much, much wider audience with your own and its own energetic signature that you can put on it so that it is unique. It stands out from what anybody else is doing in that field it's unique to you and unique to who and what you channel. And I think that this is all part of what is happening in our world today, where we need transcendent minds and transcendent consciousness to reach many more people who have the desire to wake up. But what they need is a practical toolkit of understanding, not a rule book of behavior. That sounds very similar to what I've been feeling too. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I can feel that from you. Do you have any passing words at all? I guess the last thing I'd say is if anyone is interested in in learning tarot, anyone can do it. This isn't something that only a select few can do. It's taking the time to learn the cards, the symbology, learning how to do spreads, but then opening up yourself to intuition as well. Thank you so much for having me. This was so much fun. And I I love talking about spirituality and diving into all the concepts that we did. So that was really fun to do that. And hopefully all of your listeners enjoyed all the conversations that we shared throughout this time. And if anyone is curious about working with me or would love to connect with me, my website is www.journeythroughtarot, all spelled out. You can receive email readings from me, one-on-one sessions, And I'm also on Instagram, same handle, Journey Through Tarot. And please feel free to reach out if you have any questions. I would love to interact with you. If you want to work with me, please, you can order through my website. Or again, you can reach out to me directly. And I'm just so grateful that I had the chance to be on here. Beautiful. I've got a question for you. Do you think some things are predetermined and some things are self-determined? Oh, I love that question. I think it's a bit of both. I do believe in free will. So I think that we get to decide how we respond to things that are put in our path. That's totally up to us. But I do think things are put in our path on purpose. And there's another podcast to listen to where, and I don't know if it's something he coined or if it's an actual expression. Either way, I love it. He says that life is happening on the corner of free will and destiny. And I think that's such a good way to say it because I think that it's exactly that. Life is happening. I do think that things happen for a reason. I've had lots of things that I can't explain too many coincidences that I happened because it was supposed to. And I think that we all have those moments where 
either A, we have the choice to dismiss it and not do anything with it and just carry on, or we have the choice to stop and say, this is peculiar and this normally wouldn't happen. What am I supposed to take from this? And I think that it's how we perceive it and how we respond to it is what makes it more destiny versus free will. That's well said. And what are you taking away from today? A lot. I think that, well, for one, I, like I said, I love talking about all the metaphysical and spiritual realms. So I loved the conversation, but I definitely took a lot from your really wise words around changing your perception in the frame. And I'm definitely going to sit with that. That was something that really struck a chord in me in a good way. And I want to focus on expanding my own lens, if you will. So that's something I definitely took from our conversation, along with just enjoying having the conversation in general. Beautiful. Thank you so much for coming on the Transcendent Minds podcast. And I want to thank you for sharing your insights, your experiences. And are there any other projects you'd like to share at all? The only thing I can think of mentioning is if you follow me on Instagram, I always do little videos and things about what cards mean or any kind of messages I feel that is supposed to be put out in the collective. So that is probably where I'm the most active on just putting words of wisdom out. So again, that's Journey Through Tarot as my handle. But other than that, the moment everything else is up in the air. As we wrap up this, this episode, I want to really extend my deepest gratitude to you, Sarah, for sharing your wisdom and your insights into the mystical world of tarot and your journey and the stories you've shared added a layer of magic to the podcast that I hope will resonate with many listeners. And I think your ability to connect with the tarot cards and guide others on their paths of self-discovery is truly a gift. And, and I see that you honor that gift and the depth and authenticity you bring to your practice is both inspiring and captivating. And it's clear to me that your passion for tarot goes beyond mere readings. It's a profound exploration of the human experience. So I want to thank you for being such a beacon of knowledge and for shedding light on the alchemy of tarot. And I think that your presence on the show has left an indelible mark. And I'm really grateful to have had the pr privilege of learning from you. So thank you very much. And that was beautifully said. Thank you. I'm really glad that was how everything I said was perceived. And that's very accurate. As tarot isn't just tarot for me. It's definitely so much more than that. And I appreciate that other people are taking that message as well. That's it for today's episode of Transcendent Minds. We hope you enjoyed this exploration of the mysteries of the mind and of the human experience. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for future episodes, we would love to hear from you. Be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts. And if you feel inclined, please leave a rating and a review as this goes a long way. And follow us on social media to stay up to date with the latest episodes. Thanks for tuning in. And until next time, keep transcending your mind.